As I said, Pastor uh, asked me to, to teach tonight. I think he's taking some well-deserved time off and getting a little rest in. And uh, I had been studying on something, so it was, it was fortuitous timing to, uh, to pick this up. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll receive the offering at the end of the service. Those of you that are watching on Facebook, welcome. Glad you could join us. We're going to be talking about something really interesting here tonight, so get your Bibles out and study along with us. This is our regular Bible study. So before we get started, though, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come this evening and receive from your Word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church, and so we make ourselves available to Him to teach us and to guide us, direct us here tonight to receive from your word, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be talking about something uh, really interesting, something a lot of Word of Faith folks don't talk about very much, uh, depending on the background they came out of. Uh, and uh, I know it was, it was kind of new territory for me to a large extent, and that is holiness. Now, if you came out of a Pentecostal holiness background, you probably heard a lot of teaching on holiness. Uh, but I was raised Southern Baptist. We didn't have a whole lot of holiness teaching. Uh, you know, the deacons like to stand out in the parking lot and smoke their cigarettes and swap stories and so forth between <laughs> services. So it was not exactly what you'd call a holiness church. Uh, but they had their limits. Baptists don't, you know, they don't uh, dance. So you couldn't go to any dances, couldn't play cards. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. You can smoke and cuss, but you can't play cards and dance. But, well, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> it makes sense to somebody. You know, it's like I heard a, a good bad to say one time, uh, I, I live a holy life. I live according to the back of my hymnal. Because there's, there's rules and regs for badness in the back of the hymnal. So. <laughs> anyway, not exactly the highest authority. I like what I heard Brother Hagin say one time. Said somebody came to him and uh, said, well, you know, it's just like the song says. And he said, like the song says. Oh, yeah, it's like that old song says. He said, that's, that's not scripture. <laughs> a lot of people have a lot of weird ideas of what, what is authority. But we're going to look at the word of God. That is the authority in our lives. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope, by the way, I'm reading from the New King James, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, I started studying the, you know, the whole topic of holiness based on something that Brother Kenneth Hagin said, uh, Brother Kenneth Hagin, Brother Kenneth Copeland, I was talking about Brother Hagin earlier. Kenneth Copeland said at the recent ICFCM convention, uh, ICFM convention, I call it ICFCM because back in the day, in 1979, it was the ICFCM, the International Convention of Faith Churches and Ministries. They shortened it down to ICFM, so I still stumble occasionally and call it by its original name because I joined back in 79. But uh, they had their 40th annual convention recently in Fort Worth, and I was down there for that. I, I was privileged to be able to teach down there on technology and ministry. Praise the Lord. That was great. But Brother Copeland had the last session on Thursday night, and he made a statement that just really went off in my spirit, and uh, it, it gave me a little different perspective on things concerning holiness. He made the statement that as born-again believers, we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We've done a lot of study on that uh, as Word of Faith folks, and we've, uh, we've heard that taught. We've, you know, Brother Copeland has taught on it a lot. And really, the whole point of right standing with God is position. We have been given right position with Him uh, through Jesus Christ. It's not because of us, it's not because of our works, but it's entirely based on what Jesus has done for us. And that position in God is something we have as believers. Uh, so we are in right standing, and that literally means we have, 
as the uh, you know, Brother Copeland has pointed out before, originally with the government, what we know as the Bill of Rights was originally called the Bill of Righteousness because it was if you are in right standing with the federal government, then the federal government considers you in right standing with them or in right position. If you get out of that right position, then you could lose your rights that are given through uh, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, meaning, for instance, uh, if you commit a felony and so forth, you could have your right to vote uh, curtailed or stripped away. So, you know, that is right standing with the government. And we have right standing with God. And that's a gift. It's absolutely a gift. And Brother Copeland made the statement. Here's what he said. Righteousness is what we've been made. That is God's gift to us. Holiness... Our walking it out in our daily life is our gift to God. And that really struck me. Holiness is our gift to God. It's something that we do on a continual basis to live right before the Lord as a gift to Him. We want to please our Father God. You know, my earthly father, I always wanted to please him. Now, he, was a, he could be a rough character. He was a sailor. And, uh, you know, he, he was a strong individualist and uh, a disciplinarian. Uh, you certainly didn't get away with anything with him. Uh, he'd, he'd take a switch to you, and I've had that done many a time, you know, and as they say, it didn't ruin me. <laughs> I'm still fine. But at any rate, uh, you know, I had a, an inner desire to please him. And he, uh, thankfully, always told me, uh, Bill, you can do anything that you put your mind to do. You can grow up to be anything you want to be. And uh, he always encouraged me and always was a blessing to me. But, as I say, he could be a bit of a disciplinarian. And uh, he also could be a little rough around the edges. He could use language like a sailor occasionally. And so I grew up with that uh, happening occasionally. And so when I was in high school well, junior high at least, uh, uh, my language was not what it should be. And one day, this is leading up to a story here, but one day I went to, uh, to school and we were told to go to the auditorium. We had a special speaker. And uh, this tells you how long ago this was, that in a regular school, they would bring together everybody in the auditorium for a minister to come preach to us. And this was a guy who was a young man, uh, I remember his name, Mike Clore. I don't know where he is today or what he's teaching, but he came and taught to the young people there in the auditorium. And he was teaching the gospel, and he was encouraging people to get born again. Of course, I was born again, but like I said, I was rough around the edges, and I was using some language I shouldn't and so forth. So I'm sitting there pretty much under conviction. And I'm thinking, Lord, I really I need to do better. I need to clean my act up. I shouldn't be acting like I'm acting. And, and here I am, I know I'm bored again. I got bored again in 69. So, you know, I know better than this. And so I was just in a repentant state. And the Lord dealt with me and said, well, I can deliver you right now of your cursing. And I said, you know, I, I'm a Baptist. What do I know? I've never heard anything about deliverance of any kind. So I said, well, all right, I'm game for that. And I just felt something in my spirit, and from then on, I never cursed. I never used bad language again. And uh, it was miraculous. I mean, when I would come up on a situation that I would normally let loose, I just would stop, and I wouldn't curse. Now, that's not to say I didn't say anything that I shouldn't have said. You know, whatever is not of faith is sin. So certainly there were times I said things that were not in faith. But as far as that habit that I had, I was delivered from that, and I praise the Lord for that. I wrote that down. I had a little journal that I kept, and I wrote that down in my journal that on that date, I was delivered from that, and I praise the Lord for it. And recently, I was on Facebook, and I was in a group that was supposed to be at least a Christian group. Uh, these were folks that, you know, uh, claimed at least to be believers, uh, you know, maybe not word of faith necessarily, but believers. And so I was in this group, and somebody posted an interesting post. They said, how many of you can say you've gone 24 hours without cursing? 
And I thought, well, that's easy. You know, in my case, I thought, oh, that's easy. But then I started noticing all these comments from these folks that are believers. Oh, I couldn't go 24 hours without cursing. And on and on and on and down further and further I read it. And the more and more I saw it, I thought, well, what do you know? I'm, I'm the exception here. I'm not the rule. I'm the exception of the people who say they couldn't go 24 hours without cursing. These are believers. These are Christians. And I got to thinking about that. Be ye holy as I am holy. And I thought, well, you know, if you can't tame your tongue, it, 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 that much even. Now, I could understand people having a problem with unbelief. They're saying things they shouldn't be saying concerning their life and so forth. But just plain old cussing? Hey, that really kind of shook me. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, you know, I can see what Brother Copeland is saying about it's time to scrub ourselves up. And he went on to say that, that we all need to get a good scrubbing <laughs> of our personal lifestyle. And he said that he had set on a quest himself to do that, to scrub himself up. And uh, he used an example that I have used in the past and I kind of like, uh, you know, we know we're forgiven. We know that we've received Jesus as our Lord. We know we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that all that is through Him and through our faith and belief in Him. But at the same time, if we sin, we know we have 1 John 1, 9, that we can confess our sin and He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, a lot of people that are teaching greasy grace these days, they want to take that scripture out of the Bible. Well... You know, it doesn't matter what you do, what you say, why I can just live any old way I want to live and I don't have to confess my sin. Well, no, that's why it's in there, is that we confess our sin in order to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Now, the reason is that, as I said, this is an example I've used before, think of it as like a pipe or a conduit between you and God. And that pipe, as long as it's cleared out, the fellowship you have with the Lord is very clear and clean and easy. You know, you talk to Him, He talks to you, you have great fellowship with Him. But if you start getting it clogged up with junk, then whatever you're praying to Him, it just seems like it's hindered. You know, and whatever answers He's sitting your way, it's like it's kind of slowed down and hindered. And so we need to keep the pipes clear. You know, get out the old roto rooter occasionally and <laughs> clean that thing out. And so uh, that's what 1 John 1, 9 is for. So Brother Copeland was talking about, you know, as he said, he said, I wasn't out running around on glory. I wasn't committing any terrible sins or anything like that. But he said, I noticed I wasn't being as strict about my confession. I wasn't being as strict on uh, staying in faith and believing God. And, and I was kind of cruising and coasting along. And he said, I just needed to tighten up the ship a little bit. I needed to tighten myself up. And he said, one example of the result of that, clean up, as he called it, cleaning himself up by confessing these things as sin, was he had always had to deal with, with back issues. And he got to the point that his back, it just hurt off and on occasionally. And it wasn't debilitating. It wasn't keeping him from preaching. It wasn't... It was just annoying. You know, it was just an annoying pain ever so often. And uh, he just kind of, I mean, he'd, you know, he'd confess the word. He'd believe the Lord for uh, his healing, everything. But he just was kind of having to live with it. And then he started totally unrelated. He started uh, cleaning up his life and, 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 you know, getting this stuff all out of his life, confessing things, straightening things up. Uh, he, he was getting up in the morning earlier and, and uh, fellowshipping with the Lord, doing more than he should be doing. And one day he woke up and he got out of bed and he noticed his back wasn't hurt. And he thought about that. He said, well, you know, I've been believing God for my back to be healed for all this time. What happened? And the Lord said, well, this is a result of you cleaning up your act. Now, Here's the thing, a lot of Christians will say, well, now wait a minute, Dr. Bill, you said that we could get healed by, by uh, stopping our sin and cleaning up our act. Well, it's not a matter of you get healed because of that, but you remove hindrances. 
See, Satan likes to throw things at you when he has opportunity. Remember what the scripture says, don't give the devil an opportunity. So we give him opportunity by opening up these doors, by uh, you know, saying things we shouldn't say, acting in ways we shouldn't act, uh, confessing things we shouldn't be confessing, so forth. All of that opens doors. So if we close those doors, then it closes his opportunity. We don't give the devil an opportunity, and we resist the devil, and he flees from us. James 4, 7. So, we, if we will live a life dedicated to God, it will benefit us, as well as praising the Lord, giving glory to Him, being a gift to Him. Ultimately, that's what we're doing it for. So let's look at verse 16 again. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now the word fear here, as we know, is not quaking terror or fear. It's respect. We have respect toward God, that honor and respect that we give Him, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with precious blood of Christ as the Lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Now notice verse 22 there. Since you have purified your souls, remember your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So we are a spirit, we have a soul, mind, will, and emotions, we live in a physical body. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We are the ones that have to purify our souls. Now the way we do that is Romans 12.1 talks about that we uh, renew our minds to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, let's look, uh, you won't have to turn there, but uh, refer to Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, there are a lot of people who would ask the question, how could I possibly live a holy life? How is it possible to live holy? Well, here it says, we purify our souls in obeying the truth. Well, what is the truth? John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word of God is truth. What do we do? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I, that I might not sin against you. So the way we live a holy life is to get the word into our heart. Now, I don't know about you, but if I study the word of God for an extended period of time, and I confess the word of God for an extended period of time, and I hear teaching for an extended period of time, it's a whole lot easier not to sin. <laughs> have you ever noticed that? That if you, if you stay in the Word and you immerse yourself in the Word and you hear good teaching, it's a whole lot easier not to sin. It's a whole lot easier to stay pure before the Lord. Yeah, but Dr. Bill, you just can't live that way day in and day out. Well, you can if you stay in the Word day in and day out. You can if you hid, hide the Word in your heart on a daily basis. If we'll lend ourselves to the Word, I, I remember, again, what I heard Brother Copeland say many years ago, uh, that when it says, attend to my Word, he said, you know, it's like he, he likes going to the coffee shop and having uh, coffee and a donut with a friend, but he might see that friend on the street and the, and the friend say, yeah, maybe down at the coffee shop, we'll have a good time. And Brother Copeland would have to say, well, that's great, I want to do that, but there's something I have to attend to first. And he used that as an example of how we should be attending to the Word. Put the Word of God first place. Put it first, live it first, confess it first. If you do that, you're hiding the Word in your heart, that I might not sin against you. So we, if we live a lifestyle 
set apart unto the Lord by studying the Word of God, by emphasizing the Word of God, by staying in the Word of God, then it's much easier to live that holy lifestyle. All right, let's look at 1 John 3. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 John 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. For by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Now let's stop and think about that a minute. If our heart, our heart, doesn't condemn us, it's not that God condemns us. It's not that he says, oh, you vile sinner, I'm not going to you know, answer your prayer. That's not him. That's not his way. God wants to bless us. He wants to help us. But it's our heart that will condemn us. Now, think about me in that situation that I was talking about in the high school auditorium. I was a believer. I was a Christian. I wasn't living as fully, you know, wholly sanctified under the Lord as I should be. It was my heart condemning me for the way I was living. It wasn't even necessarily that the Holy Ghost was convicting me. My heart was convicting me. So it, we must keep our own hearts, our own spirits, from convicting or condemning us by living a lifestyle that is holy unto the Lord. Now let's keep reading. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because... Now notice this because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now notice, we have whatever we ask. There's a whole lot of word of faith believers. Ooh, hallelujah, they want whatever they ask to come to pass. They want whatever they say to come to pass. They're, oh, we want to live by faith. We want to operate by faith. We want to be blessed. Well, then your heart needs to not condemn you. Because if your heart condemns you, you won't have confidence toward God. If you don't have confidence toward God, then whatever you ask, you won't receive from Him. Because of God? No, because your heart's condemning you. Because you don't have confidence toward God. In order to have faith that God's going to bless you financially, God's going to bless you physically, that relationship has to be there. The pipe has to be clean. And that's because of our own heart condemning us. Now, I've heard a pastor talk about this, that our own heart will convict us. And that's what we've got to do. We have an internal uh, goalkeeper, if you will, <laughs> you know, an internal coach that's telling us, straighten up, boy, fly right, <laughs> get this straightened out, confess this is sin, do what you need to do here, because if I do, then I will have confidence in my spiritual life, and in my relationship with the Lord. And if that happens, then the next verse comes into play that whatever we ask, we'll receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now see, the greasy grace folks have missed it because they're all teaching, well, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just going to be blessed anyway. Well, not if you don't keep His commandments... Because if you don't keep his commandments then those th and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, you won't receive from the Lord. Now that comes as a shock to a lot of these folks. Because they see the word commandment and it's almost like old Maynard G. Krebs, you know, on the Dobie Gillis show. When he would hear about work and go, work? <laughs> and, and you know, a lot of these Christians go, commandments? Surely you're not talking about commandments. No, commandments here is an interesting Greek word. This word commandment literally can be translated prescription. Just like we go to a doctor and get a prescription. If, if I have an ache or a pain or whatever and I go to a doctor and he writes out a prescription for me and I take that to the drugstore and I get it filled and I come home and I take that medicine just like I'm supposed to, step by step by step, pill by pill by pill, just like I'm supposed to, then I can expect results. 
I can expect relief from whatever the pain is or whatever it is that this medicine is supposed to address. So if I do the prescription right, I'll get the results. That's what a commandment is. A commandment is living our life in such a way that it is a prescription for us to get right results in our life. And the reason it works is because our heart won't condemn us and we'll have confidence toward God. Now, I think about Paul. You know, a lot of people again would say, well, you know, Dr. Bill, I just, I just can't live a holy life. I'm sorry, that's just not me. I can't do it. Well, first of all, you could do it because if you can't, then God's not being just when he says, be ye holy as I am holy. Yeah, but, but Dr. Bill, that's God's standard of holiness. How am I going to be holy as God is holy? I mean, come on. Well, again, he wouldn't ask us to do it if it wasn't possible. So it is possible. Now, can we live holy enough that we don't need Jesus uh, to have come and died? Well, no, of course not. That's why he came. That's why he became the sacrifice. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he bore our sicknesses and diseases, our sins, our iniquities, and he took care of all that. Absolutely. But now that we're born again, we should be living a lifestyle that's pleasing unto him. And by doing that, it benefits us as much as it blesses the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but again, when I was growing up, my father, if I did well, and I lived up to his expectations, so to speak, and, and I did the things he wanted me to do. Uh, you know, kind of late in our relationship, he and I collab collaborated on a pictorial history of Mill's home, the orphanage that he and, and mom grew up at and that they went back to work for. And so they worked at the orphanage, and it had a history from 1885, and at this time, the centennial celebration was going to be 1985. And so by 1985, he wanted to have completed a complete pictorial history of Mill's home. And so it was a lot of work. And because I was a photographer and I had a dark room and I had all this equipment, I had to make pictures of all these old, old, old photos. And I even got a special camera that was designed just for making photographs of these old photos so that I could then convert them to halftones and put them in this history book and, and put together the book. And so I worked with Dad on that day and night, day and night, day and night for months at a time until we completed that book. And he told me after we completed it, uh, well in advance of the 1985 deadline. Uh, he said, you know, I really appreciate you working with me on this. This has been a dream of my lifetime because he's always been interested in history. He's always been interested in photography. He's always been interested in the orphanage. It just brought together all these things that were of interest to him. And then, of course, because he could work with me, work with the studio, work in the dark room, and everything that I was doing, uh, he, just, he just ate it up. He loved it. And he was very pleased with my participation in this project. And it just gave me a, a tremendous sense of pride and, and accomplishment and joy that I could bless him so much by doing what he wanted me to do. And it's the same way with, with our Father God. When we live up to his expectation, when we live up to the words goals that are set in our lives, then he's pleased by that. He enjoys that. He takes pleasure in that. And that is worthwhile. That's worth doing. And so not only does it bless him, not only does it please him, but again, it benefits us because if our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. He goes on to say, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, just like I was talking about pleasing my father. And this is his commandment. He makes it clear. Here's his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. Now remember that commandments are prescriptions. So these are the prescriptions he's given us, prescriptions of life, how to live a life of blessing, how to live a life that is pleasing before God. 
He who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. Well, if God's in there, so to speak, if the Holy Ghost is in there, it's a whole lot easier to live a holy life. We just lean to that. Now, the Scripture says we have the mind of Christ. Not we will receive the mind of Christ one day. Not, well, one of these days, when we get to heaven, we're going to have the mind of Christ. No, we have the mind of Christ. So if we have the mind of Christ, let's think with the mind of Christ. Now, I've pointed this out on several occasions when I've been teaching, that there is benefit in us as believers conforming to God's worldview. You know, uh, kids, when they're growing up, a lot of times, I know particularly Ben, when, when Belinda was homeschooling him, they, they had a whole course section on worldview, establishing your worldview. And it talked about uh, politics, and it talked about society, and it talked about lifestyle, it talked about all these different kinds of things. Everybody has a worldview. Now, you may have noticed on the news recently, there are a lot of people that have worldviews that are squirrely. <laughs> I mean, wild stuff that people are saying, they're professing, they're believing, that are completely contrary to the Word of God, completely contrary to sound doctrine. Well, what I want to do is find out what God's worldview is and conform myself to His worldview. If I do that, then again, it's easier to live a lifestyle of holiness. If I know how God thinks, mind of Christ, if I know how He wants me to act, then I'll do as Jesus did where He said, I don't do but what I see my Father do. I don't say except what I hear my Father say. Well, how are we going to do that? Staying in the Word again. It goes back to that scripture in Psalm 1911. Your Word have I hidden in my heart. If I look into the Word of God, I'll find out what God's worldview is. I'll find out what he thinks about politics. I'll find out what he thinks about society. I'll find out what he thinks about marriage. I'll find out what he thinks about, you know, homosexuality and so forth. All these issues that people talk about. What does God think about them? It's in his word. So if I get into his word and I hide his word in my heart, then I won't sin against him because I'll be living according to his worldview. And if I do that, then I'm going to be successful in life. Matter of fact, let's go over to uh, Joshua. Hadn't planned to do this, wasn't in my notes. I know Belinda said, you said you weren't going to get outside your notes. Yeah, well, we know better than that. Joshua chapter 1, some of you know where I'm headed. I'm like, Pastor, this is new Bible, so I'm kind of having to get the pages unstuck here. There we go. Joshua chapter 1. And let's begin in uh, verse 6. God is speaking to Joshua here. Uh, Moses now has died. Joshua is the one left in charge. And God says to, to Joshua, Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law. Now we would say today all the word because the law is all they had at the time. But the word is what we have now. According to all the word which Moses my, my servant commanded you, do not turn from it, do not turn from the word from the right hand or to the left, why? That you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, you will keep speaking the word, keep the word in your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you meditate in it that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, if you do what the word says, then you'll make your way prosperous. Notice, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So if we'll live by the Word, we'll have success according to the Word. If we'll hide the Word in our heart, we'll have uh, success because we'll be not sinning against God. 
our spirit, our heart, will have confidence toward God because we're walking out the life of the lifestyle of God, the mindset of God, in fact, the worldview of God, which is in His Word. If I observe to do according to all that's written therein. Now, I know that doing everything that the Word says to do is a pretty high mark to shoot for. But remember what Paul said in Philippians 3.14. He said, I press toward the mark of the high calling. See, he was looking at it like a sporting event. Like, I am pressing for that mark. I am pushing for that high calling. I am, I am going for it. Well, that's what we need to do when it comes to a holy lifestyle. Can we live an absolutely pure holy lifestyle before the Lord? Are we going to miss it? Yeah, we're probably going to miss it occasionally. You know, I think there's probably a pretty good chance we will miss it occasionally. But that's what 1 John 1 9 is for. That's why we go and repent and confess our sin and receive forgiveness for our sin. And then we pick ourselves right up, we shake ourselves right off, and we keep moving and pressing toward that mark. If we get up and keep going, keep pressing toward the mark, keep observing to do according to all that's written in the Word, then we will be making our way prosperous. Then we will have good success. We will have success in life through the Scriptures by living out the Word of God in our day-to-day -day lives. That's worth shooting for. It's worth putting that goal out there. Now, I've said many times, and particularly with regards to faith, you know, if you shoot for the stars, you may fall short and hit the moon. But at least you'll have hit the moon. If you shot for the moon and fell short, you wouldn't even hit that. <laughs> so we need to shoot for the high mark, like Paul said. Shoot for holiness, living that holy lifestyle. Okay, maybe we'll miss it. Probably we're human and we will, but... We keep pressing toward that mark. We keep pushing for our best. And that's what we want to do is give God our best. Our best life, our best uh, shooting for that mark. And by doing that, we'll experience success. We'll experience blessing. We'll experience our needs being met day to day to day. And I think there's a lot of believers that are seeing lack of success, shall we say, when it comes to their faith life, maybe concerning healing, maybe concerning finances, maybe concerning other areas, because they're not concentrating on keeping their own life pure before the Lord. And because of that, they're leaving themselves open for opportunities for Satan to come in and mess them up and clogging that pipe up and keeping that fellowship and freedom with the Lord for being as clear and clean as it should be. So that's why I'm encouraging folks to be ye holy, even as the Lord is holy. Now, you know, Paul was confident enough that he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I want to be that confident. I, and the word that's used there, the Greek word that's, that talks about follow me, that word is mimetes in the Greek, which is where we get the word imitate. So he said, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. So as I'm walking toward uh, the lifestyle that I'm supposed to live before the Lord Jesus, then it's safe to imitate me in that attempt, is what he's kind of saying. And so that's what we ought to do. We ought to be examples to other believers of those who live a lifestyle of faith, those who live a lifestyle that is as pure before the Lord as we possibly can be, shooting for that high mark. So I want to be one of those that when the Facebook thing comes out, I can boldly answer, yep, I can make it 24 hours, no problem. <laughs> you know, I want to be one that can stand up and say, I live the best I can for the Lord. Do I miss it? Sure I miss it. But I confess that is sin, I move on, and I do what I can do to live that kind of lifestyle. I think we've, we're shooting far below what we need to be shooting for. We need to be shooting for a higher mark than we are. And so I just wanted to take a little time tonight to encourage us to shoot for that higher mark 
and to live that lifestyle before the Lord that is a holy lifestyle. Praise the Lord. All righty. Hallelujah. Well, let's uh, receive our offering tonight. Uh, I guess do we, we could give it electronically. That's the best way. Uh, and I know Jessica's putting up on the, the Facebook page there. If you want to contribute to Faith and Victory Church, I encourage you to do that. You can give through our uh, PayPal portal. You can send the donations at fvc.org, or you can use uh, Square Cash if you have that capability as well. I know we like to do that. It's just easier for us to, to give technologically, I think, because all the funds move <laughs> electronically these days. It's just easier to deal with. Hallelujah. So I encourage you to do that. And we'll receive it and use it for the work of the gospel. Hallelujah. I'm believing that it won't be too long. We'll have our own building again. We'll have a lot of other things that are uh, kind of more permanent than where we're at here. I praise the Lord for our facilities that we have here to use. But I tell you what, I'm looking forward to that day. We can set everything up and not have to tear it down and put it up and tear it down. Yeah. Hallelujah. And just be able to walk in and have a service. Praise God. Amen. That'll be great. All righty. Well, let's... Uh, Let's close in prayer here, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come together. We believe that your word has, has gone into our spirits as seed. And Father, we believe that it, it will manifest in our lives that we will live a holy lifestyle before you according to your word. And as we live according to your word, we believe that we will have success, we'll have prosperity in our personal lives in all areas, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, those of you that are watching via Facebook, we are glad you joined us tonight. Remember until next time that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Amen.